it's going to make a start because uh, then we can be only five minutes late so that would be terrific uh, so I'm Stuart Hazeldean from the University of Edinburgh and I'm one of the co-directors of OxyRC so it's good to keep on being able to meet a couple of times a year uh, exchange progress sympathize about uh, backwards moves but mostly now it's progress so this is terrific so we've moved from yesterday talking about uh, a UK naval gazing focus, which is always terrific and very self-affirming, uh, to acknowledging the existence of Europe and the rest of the world uh, today and this morning. So three good talks. Uh, and I'll just remind all speak three speakers that you've got 15 minutes each. And we're going speaker, 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 and then we'll take all questions at the end with the Slido. So if you've got questions in the meantime, you can go to the Slido and type your question on or save it to load up on the Slido, or you can ask the question in the room later. Uh, the whole thing will be recorded on Zoom as yesterday, so there'll be uh, a Zoom voice a recording and a Zoom uh, visual recording, I guess. And then when we're asking questions at the end, we'll use one of the roving microphones, so wait to speak until you've got a microphone, otherwise you won't exist on the recording. Uh, anything else I need to say? Now I'm happy with that, right? Okay, so first up, uh, I'm pretty, uh, welcome Joop Hassenberg uh, from uh, Brussels, who now works for CCSA. Joop's uh, been a, an explainer and a media correspondent and a book author throughout his entire career so far, uh, but has joined the Carbon Capture and Storage Association, who are taking the UK model for industry representation and exporting that into Europe. So maybe. The UK origin can be uh, globally dominant with the UK takeover of Europe. But anyway, as you know, uh, lots and lots of activity happening in Europe. So I'll uh, hand over to you up to explain some of that. Uh, thanks, Stuart, and thank you for the invitation on, uh, from the UK research community, CCS research community, to speak here. Um, in my presentation, I will indeed give an, an overview of the policy market developments. Uh, in the EU, I'm not sure if it will be copy paste of what the uh, UK is doing, but the UK is certainly uh, one step ahead of the curve uh, when it comes to uh, CCS policies. Um, so, um, as, as most of you are already familiar with the CCSA, the Carbon Capture Storage Association is the trade association accelerating the commercial deployment of CCA US through advocacy and collaboration. Uh, we represent really the commercial interests. Uh, of the of the sector active in uh, well companies active in CCUS uh, and we have more than 120 members now. I joined in uh, August and then we had 106. So this this is really like a really quickly growing community, at least from the trade side of things. Uh, so we actually represent a full value chain. So capture developers, engineering and equipment, uh, oil and gas companies, consultancy, storage developers, and the transport and infrastructure. Um, operators. Uh, we have grown our presence in Brussels uh, as there is now really a growing uh, uh, policy and market momentum in, in the EU. So I think now overall there are more than 70 public announced projects in the pipeline and there are many more which are not announced uh, yet. Uh, so I would like now to move to the uh, first topic of my presentation. Just get the, yeah, uh, it's the policy and market developments uh, in the EU. Um, since uh, so early February was a very important moment uh, in, in the CCS policy developments in Europe, um, uh, which has been going on for a long time with the publication of the uh, CCS directive um, in, uh, in Europe um, um, in 2009, because in, in uh, early 2024, so in February, the uh, EU finally uh, announced and released its car industrial carbon management strategy. And we've been waiting for this um, uh, document to be released uh, for a long time uh, because of the quickly growing developments in the EU. Um, uh, we, are, we really need a strategy to bring those different markets uh, together. And because there are lots of problems now with you know, chicken and egg situation, but also a lack of regulatory framework. Uh, the strategy really includes a lot of components, including modeling figures to forecast the uh, role of CCUS to reach 90% greenhouse gas emission reductions by 2040. And that, can, that actually that announcement of the 2040 target uh, of 90% uh, was also released on the same day as this carbon management strategy. So you really see that 
um, carbon management or CCS is really an, a, a crucial part of reaching, uh, according to the Commission and also according to us, uh, to reach uh, this, uh, this uh, very high uh, climate uh, goal. Uh, so what does it mean uh, for the um, for the, actually the storage uh, targets or projections, because they're not official targets, is that uh, up to 450 million tons of CO2 will need to be captured by uh, 2050 annually. Uh, right now we are at zero, so this, this really uh, shows you the challenge. Uh, and this is a total uh, market value of up to 100 billion euros. So this is going to be really a, a multi-billion euro industry, uh, but also one with uh, hundreds of thousands of direct jobs involved, and uh, hopefully also millions of jobs preserved, thanks to CCS, because it will, if we do it right, then we can actually use CCS to really to get to a market of low carbon products like clean steel, green steel, and uh, um, uh, net zero cement and other products that can really keep Europe competitive. Uh, but uh, yeah, this requires a really massive ramp up of CCS. Uh, it's feasible, but we really need the right uh, resources. Um, uh, the other uh, very important uh, piece of legislation that was agreed actually at this year is the Net Zero Industry Act, which uh, obliges uh, companies or the EU uh, and then oil and gas companies to contribute to it to store 50 million tons of CO2 per annum by 2030. Uh, so this really requires a lot of investments, billions of investments already by 2030. So this is why a strong investment uh, framework is crucial. Um, and the EU will also develop a storage atlas uh, to, um, uh, to, to, to map, let's say, all the possible CO2 storage locations uh, in the EU and in Norway, not in the UK. So we have a bit of an issue there. Uh, but we're trying to, to bring those data sets uh, together because it's, of course, uh, very weird if we're going to have one uh, CCS market in isolation and then the EU and Norway uh, developing another uh, market. Um, so um, what does it look like? Uh, so this comes straight from the uh, communication uh, of the 6th of uh, February. Uh, so um, you see here that uh, the carbon capture for fossil fuel power plants uh, and, um, and uh, with more than 50 million tons of CO2 captured by 2040, starting to produce uh, e-fuels. And that is uh, really, really interesting uh, because right now uh, uh, DAC and, and, and BEX is, uh, is a technology or a sector that is hardly developed. Uh, it's still very expensive uh, to do, but it seems that the Commission is putting a lot of high hopes uh, into this, especially from the 2040s uh, uh, onwards. Um, but you also see that the fossil fuel emissions uh, more at the bottom uh, are actually, uh, so these are uh, the, the, the projections for 2030, 2040, 2050, the, the, letter, the, the, the figures are a bit small. Uh, you see that the, the fossil fuel emissions uh, are, are still there. The, the, that's, the, that's the, I think I'll do this here, yeah, that's the gray part. And then this part is still the, the, the process emissions, like for instance, from the combustion uh, of lime in cement uh, factories. Um, um, so this leads us to the, then the net zero industry act that I already, um, oh, sorry. Um, just to show, show once again, the, 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 the vision. And again, this is just, you can find these uh, stats or these graphs uh, in the, um, um, in the in the in the communication of the um, of the CCSA of sorry of the of the Commission, um, and and there you see that that in, in all different scenarios that there should be a lot of uh, duck so direct air capture in order to become uh, net zero <coughs> not climate zero net zero by by 2050. Uh, but uh, the 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 weird thing for for us at least is that uh, you see there that. Um, there is still this large amount of um, uh, power CCS, which is funny because even uh, Euroelectric, which represents the electricity companies in Europe, doesn't think that we'll have a lot of power, BC, uh, power CCS uh, by, by 2050. So, um, and, then, and then here you see how, many, how much of this, um, this uh, captured CO2 will actually then, according to the Commission, be reused. So when I started this job, I always heard that 
uh, the, the, the CCU market would be, let's say, uh, about 10% of the total of the stored. But, but for the Commission, they say that up to half of the captured uh, CO2 uh, will be actually be reused, uh, for instance, for as a, as a feedstock, but also uh, for, for, for e-fuel, so mainly for sustainable aviation fuel. And for, I think for uh, 2050, this equals like 153 or 150 uh, million tons of CO2 annually used for uh, sustainable aviation fuel, which will still result in emissions. But we can discuss this later. So then we go back uh, to, to the policy framework. So I mentioned already the, uh, the NZIA. Um, we have, um, let me see. Yeah, uh, the, this, this is really uh, an important one because it's not just the target of, 20, of 50 million tons of uh, CO2 captured by 2030, but also it's the first in its kind actually in the world uh, storage obligation uh, with, with um, uh, oil and gas companies being forced to contribute uh, to this, uh, to creating uh, those, uh, those things. Uh, and also if uh, there are the, 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 this contribution is not bad, then actually will be, be fined. Um, there's, there's actually also, uh, importantly, uh, there will be uh, a permitting time, so often it takes six to ten years to develop a CCS uh, project, a bit similar, for instance, offshore wind, but we need to, of course, make this shorter. Uh, so one thing that we have to do is actually to limit that maximum permitting time uh, that uh, local authorities uh, have uh, to, to award uh, this, this permit. Um, and uh, I think that is 12 or 18 months. Uh, and also uh, countries need to, member states need to actively uh, uh, create the, the infrastructure uh, needed. Um, just looking at, yeah, sorry, just need to get to my next page. Um, and uh, another part of this net zero Act, which is going to be adopted probably in uh, June, is that uh, uh, member states need to work on standardization of CO2. So this is already happening in forums like SEN and SENELEC. But the Commission or the National District really stipulates uh, how and when this uh, must uh, be done. Uh, did I forget anything? Uh, well, yeah, there's the ABORC declaration, but um, that is uh, for the CCS forum, so that's maybe a bit too detailed uh, for you because it's really about uh, EU policy making on an annual basis. The CCS forum is a bit of a, a talking shop from the, from, from the Commission, which uh, gathers annually. Um, yeah, I think I'll just leave it with that. So yeah, here you see the, the timeline. Uh, so um, once it is published, this uh, net zero industry act, then it's immediately getting into force. And that means also that uh, the oil and gas companies need to start working on uh, pre preparing this injection capacity already by uh, the second, um, uh, the third half of uh, 2024. So the third half, the third quarter of 2024. Uh, uh, I'll just leave it there for uh, one minute uh, for you to take notes. Um, so going back then to market developments. <coughs> yeah, just skip this. Uh, so this is a bit of a dense uh, slide. I'm um, sorry about this, uh, but um, it's really showing you uh, the momentum that is uh, in the market. Uh, recently, the, the result of the new innovation fund has been uh, published. And uh, the Innovation Fund is uh, uh, funded through the revenues of the ETS um, and uh, has like billions of euros uh, per year available for uh, clean uh, tech products and more on the innovative side of things before they're really uh, uh, deployed in the market. And uh, I think about 40% of those Innovation Fund uh, funded projects are from the CCS sector. So that's very high. Oh, two minutes. Okay. Yeah, um, so um, I will just skip the, um, the details here. Uh, I just want to show you that most of the um, projects are in the North Sea. Um, so we have a risk of leaving out uh, a part of, uh, of, let's say, the rest of Europe, which very little activity around uh, the Mediterranean. And especially in Central Europe, we have a problem because there's really not a market uh, currently being developed. So, uh, one thing that might be interested for some of you in the room is that uh, I'm also the Secretary General to the Zero Emissions Platform, uh, and uh, that's the EU artificial advisory body on uh, CCS, mainly on research and development, 
but now also there is a new uh, committee uh, which is called the Projects Network, and we had a launch event in uh, Rotterdam with 125 uh, participants, uh, really bringing together project developers from all across <coughs> Europe to exchange uh, ideas, but also to get educated on all the pitfalls uh, and, and the potential of, of developing those So This is actually hosted by the Portals uh, uh, um, um, project in, in Rotterdam, which is the first uh, project in the EU which got an FID, which took an FID uh, only uh, last year. Uh, finally, currently in, this, in the Zero Emissions Platform, we're working on a review of the CCUS targets. I don't know if you're familiar with the SET plan, uh, but um, and the IWG9, another acronym, uh, but this is something that we do right now uh, because in this uh, implementation working group of, uh, of EU member states, we're really focusing on how many, on what the research, sorry, what the, um, what the, the from the research side, uh, the objective should be uh, by 2030, and that includes also storage uh, targets, but also uh, uh, targets uh, on capture and infrastructure. I think I'll just leave it with this. You see, too much, too much stuff. Okay, I'll just leave it like that, and um, happy to hear uh, more from my other speakers in the panel, and then your questions during the panel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shup, and thanks for keeping to time. That's always appreciated. Uh, next speaker, as you can see from your running order, is Brigitte Jacobs uh, from Netherlands, who actually has, well, has a history in working with large industrial companies and chemical processing, I guess, but now is working with TNO, the Dutch National Research Organization, and is that representative on, as an executive lead into the CATO, which is the U Netherlands equivalent of the UK CCSRC. So we have parallel lives, I think, in some respect. Yeah. So over to you for 15 minutes. Perfect. I know. So, well, you helped me there a little bit because indeed um, it's going to be uh, a time pressure in that sense. Let me just see how it, if it all works. So, yeah, thank you very much for this opportunity to actually talk with this community about uh, the updates of CCS uh, uh, in the Netherlands. So, yeah, as I said, I actually wanted to start my presentation with a brief introduction of TNL, uh, but I might just really quickly go through that. Then afterwards, um, I'm going to talk about the current um, um, yeah, uh, uh, CO2 transport and storage projects that are going on as well as indeed as some future uh, projects that we're looking at. And then I would also like to uh, take the opportunity because indeed as, uh, in my role, I, I basically work across the whole chain. So uh, from capturing all the way to transport and storage. So talk a little bit more about CO2 capture what our research domains we're looking at. Uh, definitely also want to touch on the, on the chapter of uh, uh, cluster decarbonization, but through integrated carbon capturing. So really that first step with different emitters. Um, given the relevance of clusters in the UK, and uh, yeah, I would like to highlight uh, uh, two um, uh, test installations that can help with de-risking the full-scale implementation. So, yeah, with that being said, as I said, I, I really quickly go through the introduction of TNO. So, yes, we are an, uh, the largest independent applied research institute in the Netherlands. Like I said, we have a little bit, yeah, as I said, I'm really just going to run through it because I know otherwise I'm going to run out of time. Um, um, yeah, we have over 4,000 people, so really a large institute, but we work across the complete value chain. So we work on one hand with the universities to work on the development of fundamental knowledge, but we also work with the market and, 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 and organizations to help uh, with, with the application exploitation of technology. So TNO really, majority of people are scientists that work on uh, technologies in the field of uh, energy and, and actually also circularity uh, transition. And, 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 and we're really there to, to kind of be that bridge uh, in, the, in the knowledge development, I would say. Also, what I would like to stress is that we are an independent research institute. So we're a little bit over 90 years old now. So that means that we're neither a government nor a private organization. So uh, uh, I leave it at that. And like I said, heavily based in uh, uh, the Netherlands, um, uh, scattered all over. 
So let me just talk about the CO2 transport and storage developments in the Netherlands. So yeah, I've used a couple of slides of uh, EBN um, that was actually um, uh, at the Cato event that we held last week in terms of uh, involvement in transport and storage projects. So also the Netherlands um, actually committed to the Paris Agreement, climate neutrality in 2050. And for 2030, we have the ambition to reduce the CO2 emissions with 60%. Now, obviously, the industry is an important player in that one. As a matter of fact, they will need to reduce uh, CO2 emissions with 80.8 megatons. So, uh, quite a tremendous effort. And if you look at how, um, what, 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 what's the plan indeed to achieve that, it's basically a combination of technologies. So, uh, there's energy efficiency, electrification, obviously some hydrogen. But look at the important role that CCS plays in that. It's almost 50%. So, like I said, obviously a very important contributor for us in the Netherlands to achieve our targets. So we are already working eh, on two storage projects called Portos and Aramis. And I will go a little bit more into detail into those storage projects in the next slides. But basically associated, so Portos really is close to the Rotterdam port, whereas Aramis is more further up north. Uh, closely associated with these storage projects, we're working on like infrastructure projects as well as uh, intermediate storage. So um, actually we already have a CO2 pipeline in the Netherlands since a number of years. It's called the OCAP line and it's a pipeline that brings CO2 from the port to the greenhouses in the western part of the Netherlands. And that pipeline will connect to a new to be built pipeline, a backbone in the port of Rotterdam that is connected to the Portos project. Uh, in addition, also additional infrastructure is being, um, uh, being built and uh, connecting us with, uh, with, with Germany and Belgium, and that's called the Delta Rhein Corridor. Then in the port, we're building an intermediate terminal called CO2 Next, um, where it's possible to actually offload CO2 that is transported by a shipment, so to say. So also allowing it um, uh, yeah, eh, to get CO2 uh, from other places than industry from the Netherlands into those projects. Um, like I said, quickly on Portos, because, well, it was already mentioned. Um, uh, uh, finally, we started, we're in construction now. So what is this? This is a complete CCS, CCUS system, actually, I should say, developed in the port of Rotterdam. So we're capturing CO2 from four emitters, uh, two refineries, Shell and ExxonMobil, and Air Liquide and Air Product. That CO2 then is uh, transported via pipeline to a compressor station where actually it's compressed to about 100, 150 bar and then gets injected offshore uh, about 20 kilometers offshore into a depleted um, hydrocarbon, a depleted gas field, hydrocarbon source, so to say. Um, like I said, a complete system, this is another way of uh, representing it. So first gas phase and then injected in dense phase, which obviously is a challenging exercise because on one hand, I mean, it requires careful injection because on one hand you don't want too high pressures yeah, to prevent damaging of the well. And at the same time, there's that risk of temperature drop if uh, you don't monitor the uh, the pressure release uh, very carefully. Now, what you what you see here is actually it's working with an existing platform. It's the for those of you that are familiar with the uh, with the fields in the North Sea, it's the former P18 gas field. So there's potential of partially, I would say, reusing the platform as well as the well. Uh, like I mentioned, 20 kilometers off the coast, and uh, there's injection around between like 3,000 and uh, 3,500 meters. So um, it's designed indeed, like I said, yeah, basically, yeah, as we speak, it's, it's full with its four emitters, so that is a 2.5 megaton capacity per year and a total capacity of 37 megatons. Uh, where are we today? Like I said, really exciting stage. FIT was taken last October. So uh, finally, um, uh, we, we've started construction early this year and we start the injection in 2026. 
Now, like I already said, this is basically just a small project. So we're already working towards a yeah, larger yeah, <coughs> sister or brother, what you call it, uh, from Portos. It's called Aramis. Now, what is Aramis? Aramis is a public-private partnership. So that, that is intended to be an open access system. Um, and basically, it connects to Portos three in a, through an, a pipeline um, designed for 22 megatons per year, which is about 200 kilometers, so quite a distance. Um, yeah, we, we, we're going to start the project with actually three stores, yeah? one from Shell, one from Total Fina, and actually one from uh, Neptune, so with an initial capacity of 7.5 megatons per year. But like already seen in the offshore pipeline, I mean, it is designed to grow. So hopefully with the years, indeed, um, other storage locations in the North Sea, they will connect. We expect an overall capacity of over 400 megaton. And like I said, it's intended to be an open access. So indeed, uh, uh, also for um, other European clusters uh, uh, to be used. Uh, so where are we with this project? So feasibility studies, they were all completed. And right now we're really in the design of concept. Uh, <coughs> now, hopefully next year uh, we can we can finalize this phase and formalize the partnerships. And then that would allow us uh, to start uh, uh, injecting in 2028. Well, you, you see we already, because of experience from Portos, we already put an S asterisk there. In case of appeal against the final permits, um, yeah, we expect a one-year delay of final investment. But like I said, a really exciting project with quite some potential. And that indeed brings me to the future. Yeah? Like I said, um, I think in the Netherlands we're quite fortunate with yeah, the potential in the North Sea of storing CO2. And um, yeah, we work actually in a quite structured approach actually on further building that potential uh, uh, through this pipeline support. So what you see is uh, we're currently screening different new storage options, uh, not only depleted gas fields, actually also aquifers. And like I said, yeah, it has sometimes, uh, yeah, uh, it, it, it happens that a store uh, isn't um, uh, suitable, so it doesn't make it to the end. Uh, so this is important to kind of keep that pipeline full. But like I said, our intention is indeed to uh, um, use the potential and, and, and really help uh, the EU, EU by becoming an, uh, and playing a major role in the European energy transition. So we have portals as the startup, Aramis, uh, to kind of the scale up, and like I said, with the potential to grow uh, 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 to even further, so to say. Um, here you see the potential. Okay, so with that being said on the development, uh, transport and storage, I also would like to talk, I mean, since we're at a research organization, uh, talk about some uh, research work that we were involved in last year. So we, we've really worked on two uh, clear R&D directions, degradation and emissions. So STNO are obviously involved in many uh, yeah, large European um, uh, projects, and they are all open, huh? so uh, uh, yeah, accessible for everyone. And I definitely encourage you also to check out the websites. So like I said, two clear directions, degradation of the solvent technology and emissions. And emissions, it's actually not only to air, but also emission um, yeah, in the, of CO2 quality in the chain, so to say. But to start off with the degradation, so we completed the launch project, the large project last year uh, that looked at the degradation of solvent technology, more specifically predicting and controlling amine degradation. Like I said, it really was a big project. Um, and what we did there is actually we looked at uh, degradation or ran a, 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 a couple of different yeah, uh, uh, scenarios, demonstration locations where we tested different technologies, uh, different sectors. So really looked at like yeah, variations in terms of um, uh, effect of degradation of the solvent. Now, what I would like to point out here yeah, uh, at RWE, it's a uh, lignite power plant. Um, we ran a campaign with CESO1. So, again, I mean, all of these solvent technologies, they're open solvent technologies, so we can freely publish all results there. 
Um, like I said, it was a campaign of four years, so the longest campaign ever. And uh, interestingly enough, um, the solvent actually didn't degrade. So we, we, we stopped the campaign because, uh, well, the solvent degraded, but not that it wasn't suitable. It was still okay, let me put it this way. Um, so we stopped the campaign because the project stopped, uh, so to say. Then we also tested it at uh, AVR, which is an energy for waste incinerator in the Netherlands. It's actually the first, I should say, because nowadays we also have a full-scale capture plant in, uh, in Twins uh, at the second energy for waste uh, operator in the Netherlands. But here we tested uh, the MEA technology, like I said, on a scale of 12 tons uh, uh, CO2 per hour. And there what we saw with MEA was that um, a degradation, yeah, after a certain point of time, it really exponentially took off, so to say. So if you compare both these two uh, solvents, you clearly saw, yeah, Caesar, yeah, there is uh, slow linear degradation, whereas indeed, uh, with um, um, uh, Maya, it was a complete different picture. Again, I invite you really check out this report with much more details. Another thing that I also would like to highlight and what we looked at in this project was comparing, well, <laughs> comparing size of capturing. Um, uh, there we ran two parallel campaigns. So we ran Maya both at um, in Niederhausen and at the RWOE plant as well as uh, the mini plant at TNO. And what we saw there was actually the degradation behavior was identical. So size didn't really matter. Um, however, indeed, obviously timing eh, for degradation testing is of big importance, but it was great. I mean, we tracked um, degradation products like formate, oxalate, and it were identical profiles. So you, you, you might as well eh, uh, see your, your degradation behavior eh, in a smaller scale plan, just eh, an exact copy of uh, what, the, what the big picture looks like. Now, since Stuart already gave me a sign, I invite you actually to check out Scope. It's still running. It's a very cool project on emissions. Very, very relevant. Also large project. Uh, because I would like to um, bring to your attention the integrated carbon capturing. Um, so, like I said, we're here really looking at integrating the capturing steps. So, uh, we, last year we completed actually a national project at the Moordai cluster. Um, there were 11 partners, or sorry, 10 partners, about seven of them were emitters. Some big ones, um, energy for waste, uh, gas-fired power plants, some small ones, a glass manufacturer with like 80 kilotons, uh, um, uh, asphalt recycling. And we um, did an economic, uh, technical economical assessment uh, uh, on four scenarios. So there was the base case, basically every company uh, um, yeah, designs its own CCS chain. Then there was a case where we said, okay, let's combine all the flue gases and run it through one absorber. And then there was a case, uh, no, huh? each one has its own individual absorber, but we are going to combine the rich solvent, run it through one stripper. And then a fourth case was a combined conditioning step. And what we learned there, that um, is the winning scenario was actually the combined solvent technology, so running it with one stripper. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, then I'll, I'll finish off after this slide. That would led to almost a 9% cost reduction on the, for the whole cluster. But you can imagine, had the smaller emitters like the glass manufacturers, they reached 30 to 40% uh, uh, cost savings. So, like I said, integrated <coughs> carbon capturing, and on paper, very attractive for uh, uh, small emitters. Now, obviously, um, the stakeholder management is crucial in that one. I like to bring to your attention, because that's another exercise on integrated post-combustion capturing that we worked on last year and that you can also play around with, um, another large project called Realize that looked at decarbonizing the um, uh, refinery industry and that also has obviously different CO2 sources, um, yeah, developed a tool uh, called the Octopus tool that is uh, uh, um, open access, available uh, uh, yeah, on the net, um, where, where you could actually play around uh, uh, in terms of running these scenarios of combining um, uh, CO2 from different sources. 
So like I said, we have a video that gives a little bit more explanation, but also indeed uh, check out that, uh, that tool and indeed request an, um, yeah, eh, an, a password to access, like I said. And you, you could yeah, either eh, do it in an, in, on your own location with multiple sources, but like I said, you can also do it uh, uh, um, on a cluster level. So uh, you, can, you can see for yourself. Yeah, I'm just going to leave it at that. I just want to point out to Deed, like I said, the importance uh, of uh, uh, yeah, pilot testing uh, to de-risk full-scale implementation. And like I said, we, we, we basically um, offer two services, uh, uh, the smaller one on-site diagnosis that, that looks at impurities uh, in, in the gas as well as the particles, uh, both for the degradation and the emission. But I also like to point out the mobile capture plant that uh, uh, yeah, we now have two, but that really can come on location and test eh, the uh, capture process on your actual flue gases. So it uh, really gives a good read when it comes to uh, degradation and uh, emissions. So I'll leave it at that. Now, we'll see if there are questions. That's great. Well, thank you very much, Brigitte, and obviously lots happening in Netherlands in actual uh, real projects being constructed and lots of scope for cooperation on post-combustion capture into the future. Uh, so now we're going to change uh, to go to Acker uh, Carbon Capture, who are developing real projects and designing real equipment. And David Phillips is the uh, UK head of markets in that, and he's also, I guess, he's going to talk technically and he may or may not give the update on company news as well. So over to David for 15 minutes again. Cool. Well, I spotted you're a tough guy uh, coming to the uh, 15 minutes, so I'll be, uh, I'll be sharp. <laughs> um, good. Well, firstly, thank you, folks, for the invite. Uh, Karis and the rest of the uh, CCSRC team, I really appreciate the chance to come along. Um, I spent most of my life in the commercial and financial world. Um, I'm actually a bit of a closet chemist by background. I did, did a PhD a long, long time ago, which I never used apart from getting upgrades on BA flights and cheap home insurance, which didn't always work. Uh, but now, finally, working with Carbon Capture, which I joined in the middle of 2021, I can now talk about solvents with an amines and stuff like that with our technology team and have an adult conversation, uh, which immediately no one told them about my background when I first arrived. So they gave me the Mickey Mouse Disney version. And then half an hour later, our chief technology officer said, oh, yeah, I should have told you, you could have done the other one but anyway. Um, but look, so I'm, a, so I'm, so I'm based in the UK, uh, we're obviously a Norwegian company. Um, the, these slides are lots of nice pictures because we're building stuff, as, uh, as Stuart very kindly mentioned. Um, these are going to get quite out of date quickly because just overnight, if I look a little bit grey-eyed, because overnight we were just finalising the last uh, dots and crosses on the, uh, t t of the, of the terms and conditions on a big joint venture with Slumberger, or SLB as they're now called, which we announced just recently. So we're teaming up with them. I think it's one of the biggest uh, deals in the carbon capture land so far. We're going to remain the public company, uh, but there's going to be a, a much greater, uh, putting it bluntly, financial and R&D muscle behind us, especially in North America and the Middle East and so on in the years to come. But we can talk about that as a member. That's half the press. And actually, much to the irritation of our chief commercial officer, I'm actually the first person in a public event saying that, because he, he likes to do these things, but he's missed out. Um, so look, very quickly, I won't go through the background in great detail. You, uh, the, great name, the great thing about our name of company is you can tell us, you can tell first what we do, and second, where we come from. So Arki, you can guess we're from, from Norway or from Scandinavia somewhere. We've been around for 20, 25 years. Um, initially, our focus was uh, for the Scandinavian region, Benelux in UK. Uh, we've grown across Europe a lot in the last few years as we became a separate company back in 2020. We've also got some interesting moves in, uh, in the US, uh, especially the uh, lower 48 and pulp and paper and so on. And the first moves also into the Middle East with someone called Aramco, who I believe is quite big. Um, we mentioned different industries here. I'm not going to go through our commercial model because effectively anyone who knows about solvents knows it's, these are comments on size, not on necessarily capability. What do we do? Well, uh, we're, so we're a smaller company, uh, up until last night's press release, but we're a smaller company. Uh, we, the Just Catch Offshore is a bit of a niche product, so you can effectively cover that up with a finger. And then we have small, medium, large, and extra large. So small, medium, and large is modular. So we do all of that. 40,000 tonnes per year is more, a, I would say, a pilot unit. Uh, maybe we, have doing, we are doing designs for some of these with some of the small-scale PTX and CCU operations we're looking at in Europe. Um, but it's a niche, it's more a, a pilot phase project. 
Just Catch 100 is our most mature modular design. It actually was written on the back of an envelope or back of a napkin in Oslo somewhere, back in the early 2000s as an approach. Um, it then was, became a real thing after we built Technology Center Mongstad, in Mongstad, obviously, uh, in 2012. And that was then modularized and made a lot smaller and more compact and so on. This is the one that we are delivering and almost finished at Twents uh, in the Netherlands. It's the one we're delivering five for Orsted. By the way, there are some, some nice, f nice pictures to come, so we'll get to that bit in a second. Um, and also, uh, uh, probably our biggest volume of studies is around that size. Just Catch 400, surprisingly enough, is 400,000 tons a year. Uh, that's the sort of uh, slightly fatter cousin. That was launched uh, late last year. Uh, we're doing a feed on that in Norway at Celsius, big waste of energy. And we're also doing, we have done pre-feeds in the US through our pub and paper. Hopefully, fingers crossed, that'll become feed in the next one or two months. Um, that was a deliberate move. You said there was a bit of a gap between 100 and 400. Yes, there is. 400 also is more flexible, but it's a deliberate gap because the, the opportunity when we looked to the market was obvious that if you can do 400 and stack them, or well, stack them or, uh, side by side, not virtually, obviously, but if you can stack them side by side, you can address 800 and maybe 1.2 million tons. So roughly million tons and below, you can address to a modular solution. And I won't go into, if you want to ask about it, please do. But the modular stuff is, you know, you know the idea between modular, if you're an engineer, it's, uh, it's quicker to deliver, it's a simpler design, the engineering is much less, the construction is more hookup than building piece by piece, so it's cheaper. That's the basic idea. The big catch, as we call it, the big one, uh, this is where we are a sub-supplier to someone else to build it. So we don't take the big construction risk around building a mega scale two million ton per year plant, but we'll work with someone who will build it. And obviously, if it's a new build, we'll, we'll work maybe with a, with a consortium as well. But that's what we do. So we build, we, do, we, do, we deliver modular plants, and we deliver the key equipment for the big ones. Uh, this is a, typically, anyone who's an engineer will cringe at this because it's far too simplistic, but just as an idea, this arrives, uh, the Just Catch 100 arrives in crates, in containers. Um, the big piece of the kit, the absorber, desorber, are road transported, at least in Europe, we've done so far with Twents and what we'll do with Orsted. Um, just as a comparison, not, TCM, by the way, uh, we love acronyms, TCM is Technology Center Mongstad, 80,000 ton per year, big plant we built in 2012, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, that, that was not built to be compact, let's be honest. But the Just Catch is effectively the great, great, great grandchild of TCM. And it's 40%, uh, sorry, 90% smaller by footprint if you uh, fly your drone over, and also 90% cheaper in terms of simple, pure cost per ton. Now that's version one. So version one, Just Catch 100, is what we're delivering for Twents. Version three, I don't know about version two, it's on someone's laptop somewhere in Oslo. Version three is what, uh, so what we're delivering for Orsted. And version three is already 10%, roughly, smaller and cheaper than version one. And that's simply by building it. By, well, why is that scaffolding there? The space in this corner, we could shrink this a little bit. It's just basic learning by doing. Now, obviously, that doesn't happen every time, but doing this is so important. And doing, it's great to talk about aliens in the lab with, your, with, my, with my hat on, and my, with my PhD hat on, but really building these in real life to see how they really work out and how you can improve how they're assembled is, is so important. Just a very quick comment on the market. So ever since we appeared in the middle of 2020, if you add up all things we're building, all the things we're designing in detail, like feeds, all the things that we're designing a little bit high level, like studies, it covers roughly 40 million tons per year of capture. And of that 40, 20 came last year. So last year was a very obvious pickup in activity. And it was mostly Europe. It wasn't the good old US of A. It wasn't the US waking up and going crazy. Of that 40, about three is in the US. The big step up is Germany, France, Netherlands, a little bit of Switzerland, uh, and more in Scandinavia. So it's a real big European uh, movement on the back of some of the policies we heard about in the, in the, in the earlier, earlier talk. So nice photos time. So Twents in the Netherlands. So um, this is basically finished. It's going through testing. It's called its first CO2. Um, and uh, this will be selling uh, CO2 into the Dutch horticultural market. So if you buy red peppers or tomatoes, it may, may, may well have been grown, helped, or at least helped to grow by some CO2 from this waste energy plant in uh, at Twents. This is, um, the, this is going to be obviously a landmark project for us. Um, it is, as I said, version one, um, and uh, I'm sure there'll be a, there's already a long queue of disorganized and, uh, and keen people to look at this and see what it really looks like in, in real life. 
but they're very, very important. And I should also say a delightful customer as well. Uh, this plant has a, emitted, has a emissions footprint of 400,000 tonnes a year, so you might guess they need more than one. Maybe a good thought for the future. Um, Brevik, this is in Norway, you can tell because it's snow everywhere. This is the old cement plant owned by Heidelberg Materials. And um, this uh, is, a, is, a, is a big old plant. Um, it's a difficult contract. It's quite complicated because uh, it's live open heart surgery. It's producing cement at the same time. You can't modularize it. You have to build it on site. So it's been, a, it's been a quite a challenging project to do. But this is finishing uh, mechanically complete end of this year, starting up uh, next year as part of Northern Lights and Longship to store 400,000 tons of CO2. Uh, this, by the way, uh, is a deliberate sizing because the footprint here is 800,000 tons of CO2. And you think, was that a typo? We're like, no, no, no. It's a deliberate choice because the, the cement has quite a lot of waste heat, but not enough to be a really good offset like other industries, like, for instance, smelting and uh, waste to energy and so on. So this was a deliberate picture or deliberate uh, size to have virtually a complete offset of the heat needed for the system, for the desorption, from the waste energy from the plant itself. So it's a del deliberate choice of size. But this is Brevik, and as I said, finishing late this year, turning on in the first part of next year. Then we look at uh, down to Denmark. It's also linked to Northern Lights. So Denmark, and these are two waste energy plants using biogenic uh, feedstock uh, in, in Denmark, owned by Orsted. One is 200,000 and one is 300,000. Now this uh, is very exciting for us for a number of reasons. Number one, we are producing five of the same units. So five of our Just Catch 100s, two here and three here. And that was a notably cheaper solution than the other com competitor in this, who was chasing this contract last year, who was building two bespoke plants here and here. So this hopefully will really prove that sort of serial production modular approach in terms of cost and commerciality. Also, you may see the word Microsoft at the bottom. What's the Windows guy doing here? Well, Microsoft is here because at the other end of the, no, this is not us, but the other end of the, of the story, they are buying 2.7 million tons of removals from this project, because it's biogenic, over the next 11 years. Now, they haven't disclosed a price, but if this had not got, this has got Danish funding, Danish government funding. If this did not have government funding, it would probably have happened anyway. So and this idea of pairing up biogenic, <coughs> biomass, pulp and paper, waste to energy uh, with some type of CDR creation and therefore someone to buy it uh, to really move the economics and get things moving is fascinating. And this is becoming, I would say, if it hadn't been for last night's press release, one of, one of the flavours of this year in terms of a very, very exciting uh, style of business model. This also, uh, I mentioned, the mentioned pulp and paper, this idea of having a biogenic um, CDR purchaser in the background is also, we think, going to be sparking off the first wave of real work in the US in pulp and paper. And we announced something just the other week with a developer called CO280, um, who was working with some of the big pulp and paper companies down in that southeast corner of the US, where there's hopefully nearby cheap storage, someone to buy the, uh, buy the, buy the, buy the renewables and so on. Denmark. Next, uh, this is the other one we're doing in Oslo. This is the first Just Catch 400. We are, this is not the, the unit, this is the actual waste energy plant itself. We're just doing feed right now. This will hopefully move towards FID in the summer, maybe after summer. Norwegians like their holidays. It won't be in the summer, it'll be after the summer. Um, but this, this was a very important for us because this is the, the first large scale modular unit of 400,000 tons a year. And this also is likely to be our first moves uh, in, the, in the US as well. Uh, next one in the UK, I'll come to the UK is a very important market for us. We had some unfortunate news a few weeks ago where we were not in the chosen consortium for net zero T side, um, but uh, we'll live to fight another day, I'm sure. There's a lot to chase in this industry. But Uniper is something we're working on. We're doing a pre-feed here. Oh, sorry, doing a, a PDP, a process, process design package with, with Uniper. Uh, this does need additional transport discussion in the UK because it needs. there's no immediate pipeline route from this. But as if you can get marine transport involved, and this is, as you know, a very open discussion with the, with the government right now around supporting that type of, that type of transport solution, they are very well placed. You can see water behind it. So that's very well placed to, to, to join up with that. Um, this is a big one for us. Uh, UK overall, um, I won't go through this in great detail, but uh, as we see it, there is, there's a certain number of mega scale projects up there. Uh, there's, there's still KB3, which is chasing a future track in the, in the government funding scheme. There's obviously Uniper, um, uh, and there's also Viridor's <coughs> Waste Energy Runcorn. There's also a lot, I mean, we have, I would say, you, if it all happens, 
the UK is probably something like 30-40% of our radar screen in Europe if these projects, in terms of CO2 capture, if these move ahead in the next sort of a few years. But of course we know there are many questions in the next uh, few years as well, including things like general elections. So let's see how that happens. Um, the US, just a quick comment on the US. The US, uh, as always, is a bit wild west, um, but uh, it looks like the stuff you thought was maybe average is probably worse than average in terms of cost. You know, the very, very best gas to power, forget about it. You need $110 or more to, for the levelized cost for the whole value chain. The stuff that you think is interesting is really interesting. So problem paper, the best problem paper ones, where the, as we've done work so far, we've done some pre-feeds already. Um, the best problem paper, if you're near storage, probably works between $70 and $80 per tonne, full value chain. And that's before you count in the removals. So as the developer uh, behind this, there's an opportunity and the emitter to make some very good returns uh, because at the moment, let's see if this, uh, is the election in the US this year, I think, uh, maybe. Um, but there's, there's also, the, there's of course that question whether they will allow long-term to have 45Q giving you your tax credit direct pay benefit as well as the CDR benefit on top. But let's see. But this looks like being very much the early mover. And it's interesting to see that our big new friends at SLB, also their first big feed in the US is pulp and paper, actually using NAS, using a non-aqueous solvent, which is quite exciting. Maybe a little bit, a few more years further out. We hope this, for us, will start to see real work come in 2025, in the first half of 2025. So we hope to see some EPC or project awards then. Um, the, our big friends are more likely 2027, but it's a bit more immature in terms of technology. But um, So my last slide, almost, almost good timing, my last, I just want to talk a little bit about cost, because effectively, I know the science is fascinating, but effectively, why are we doing the projects we are? It's because the economics work. Someone somewhere reckons that they can make some money out of it, given some government subsidy or given some CDRs or something. So where do these costs fall? So these are two slices. These are based on all our studies. So this is not some finance team having a long off-site weekend pressing F9 all the time. This is proper data on projects that we looked at over the last, uh, over the last uh, three years. Probably less data in North America, a lot in Europe. The, capture, the, the, the CapEx piece, and this is based on Just Catch 100. CapEx is pretty mature. So we know uh, what we quote right now, it's within that range. And probably more like the upper end, 40, 45 euros a tonne. There are some options, extra storage, extra liquefaction and so on. People tend to go a little bit more uh, high spec. Um, so that's more like at that end. The OPEX piece is the big battleground because as you well know, energy, a huge issue in terms of the overall levelized cost of carbon capture. So where we can capture waste heat, bring that cost down, we can see some tremendous benefit. And we've done a lot of work around that. And certainly we see the best cases being absolutely at the low end of that range. And most we look at are probably between 20 and 30 euros a tonne uh, OPEX. So most of our projects we look at have a reasonable amount and probably quite good amount of waste heat uh, recapture. And transport and storage is the big unknown. It's good in the US because it's dry and near you. It's not good in Europe because it's wet and further away, <laughs> putting it very simply. And, the, and, and this is probably being quite kind because 75 euros a tonne is not what Northern Lights will quote you if you're based down outside of, of let's say, the Scandinavian area and want to look at a, what sort of tolling cost you'll have to, uh, to transport up to them, more like maybe 85 or 90. So the, the, there is a cost challenge in this, but on, that, on the overall range for Europe, bearing in mind where the currently rubbish EU carbon price is sitting, if you look at that overall range, 75 to 175, most projects are triple digit. There are a few that are lucky, but most are between 100, 110 and 140 euros a tonne. So all of them have to firstly believe the European carbon price will get to triple digit territory in a few years time. Once the front loading's done, once CBAM comes in post 2026 and so on. Let's see. Love to hear your views on that as well. <laughs> Loaded question. Um, and also you have to believe there's going to be some subsidy to help you as well. But, but nevertheless, despite the cost challenges, um, you do see, we have seen tremendous interest in this space, and you do find that the commercial reason for looking at this industry is not purely, although the price is always the number one, after that it comes down to uh, an overall net zero plan, you know, plans of being able to raise green finance, plans of being able to align with the EU taxonomy, um, and also if you make something, and this is the perfect you know, Heidelberg in, in Norway with cement, there's a view that if you cannot <coughs> offer a decarbonized, let's say, blue product in the future, then it's going to be very challenging for you to compete. So you've got to start now. So that's my story. And I'll just leave you with uh, yeah, the highlights and the disclaimer, the most exciting piece of the lot. <laughs>
Thank you. Okay, so oh, thanks very much, David, for a uh, up-to-date minute-by-minute uh, -minute talk, plus a whole portfolio of products if you happen to have the odd 100 million on you at the moment. But that's good. It's prices coming down. So questions, instructions on the screen. Yeah, Mr. Viridor. Hi, Edward Thomas from Viridor. Um, uh, sort of two questions wrapped together, really, but sort of related. The first is that, as far as I'm aware, neither Norway nor the UK are members of the EU. And yet the Norwegian storage is a big feature in terms of EU plans, but the UK isn't. What do we have to do differently to change that? And secondly, uh, in terms of the, uh, the model in the Netherlands of um, carbon use, um, what percentage of the CO2 that is um, put into uh, growing um, horticulture is actually turned into biomass in that process? Hey, what do you want to take that? Mr. Pritchett, you want to do that? Since... Yeah, obviously I can talk indeed a little bit about uh, uh, the, the use of CO2 in greenhouses in the Netherlands because indeed like Today, actually, well, especially because both of the uh, capture plants are in the eastern part of the Netherlands, less accessible to uh, uh, storage, uh, they, they are supplying their CO2 to, to the horticulture. And as a matter of fact, indeed, yeah, it's, it's that, uh, uh, Edward, that famous twist around biogenic versus fossil. So today, indeed, it, 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 it basically CO2 is CO2. But indeed, like as I said, in the next couple of years, uh, it will be mandatory that it's biogenic CO2, but it, it, yeah, it, it will just, like I said, it will not change the whole capture process as such. It's just more like an, a conversion of claiming this is biogenic CO2 versus the fossil base, because the capture plants that are being built, they don't cover the whole Sorry, volume. That wasn't the question. The question was, if I put, you know, a, a, a thousand tons of CO2 oh, into a greenhouse, yeah. how much, of, if I put a thousand tons of, of CO2 into a greenhouse in a year, how much of that is converted into peppers or oh, plants okay. yeah, that no, actually that, that, that hold is it, and how much of it is really in fact lost? Small. So literally, indeed, almost 95% uh, leaves the greenhouses uh, again. <laughs> so the, the benefit... <laughs> Now, the, so it's definitely a, yeah, a short cycle utilization option. Why is it attractive for the Netherlands? Because today, indeed, the CO2 is actu actually manufactured through um, um, uh, gas-fired power. And uh, it's an avoidance rather now. So it's by no means, indeed, that the CO2 is captured by the plant and as such, uh, uh, you know, either long-term or even storage uh, capture. The, the by far, as I said, 95% almost just 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 right. goes out. Uh, okay, so it. pass to you. Yeah. Uh, so if you can address the bit about Norway and the UK having addressed the bit about your Norway and the UK being part of Europe, but especially not part of Europe for the UK. Yeah, the simple solution is for the EU, for the UK to rejoin the EU, <laughs> <laughs> or at least. <laughs> I think that motion is passed. Um, the immediate solution is uh, for the for the UK to uh, uh, to to align the two ETS systems because now you have two separate ETS systems. But be warned, uh, the the Swiss and the UK the EU ETS systems are only aligned after a decade, so that takes a long, long, long time. Uh, there are some provisions in the carbon management strategy about mutual recognition of certificates, so that could help. Uh, but actually, I'm going to uh, Westminster later today to talk about this. Uh, but it's a big problem. Yeah. And then uh, there's a subsidiary question which you can also take, uh, yeah. which is uh, the Zero Emissions Project Network was quite a sort of transparent network uh, until a year or two ago. But how do other projects join? Just are projects from the UK allowed to join? And how do they join? They, they are. It's, it's, an, it's an open system. That, that's, that's what's makes the zero emissions platform unique in a sense, uh, but there is also a new uh, knowledge sharing network for uh, projects uh, by, by the EU is going to be set up. Um, and that is only for projects that have been awarded with the Innovation Fund or CEF funding. Uh, so, but that's separate because they actually have to do that. Yeah. Because they have money. 
Uh, but the UK is not banned from that particular, no, no. as long as we've got money. Yeah, no, right. you're welcome to join. That's good. Okay, uh, any questions from the floor? Just now, yep, go there, first of all. All right, okay, that's a short question then, John, because we're into injury time here, of course. Yeah, very, very quickly, we, we had a couple of uh, presentations on aiming testing, one on Caesar and I guess on, on ACA. Big question at the moment is nitrosamine formation in the amine uh, as it's running. Could you say anything about that? I, I think, I don't know what I can say, I know that the Caesar what tests, they reported stabilizing amine uh, nitrosamines, but wouldn't say what the levels were. That need or awesome. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you want the stick? Yeah. I'll be lazy. Get lazy and sit down. Um, that, uh, good question. Um, we have a portfolio of solvents, as you, as you know very well. Um, the, the most advanced one, S26, you know, we, we don't really have an adventurous way of naming these, but the most advanced one, S26, is um, uh, deliberately robust. And the work we've done so far, the, in most tests at Technology Centre Monster, and also uh, the work we've done, we had a 14 month test at Brevik before that was built and so on. The, the levels of nitrosamines were below levels of, of detection. And that's a deliberate, deliberate aim for us. You, know, you, you, you could argue on the, on the flip side that other solvents could have different energy characteristics, for instance. But yeah. Okay. I'm going to the question on the screen, but I don't know if we'll get an answer. All oh, right, yeah. Uh, we'll go to the question in the room. Is anybody in the room going to answer the question on the screen later? Uh, this gentleman here with spectacles, yeah. Hi there, uh, Michael White, from RWE. Um, it's a question for you. You mentioned very briefly in your presentation that the EU is looking to do something on standardisation of uh, CO2 later this year. What, what are they looking to standardise, and does it include the quality of CO2 required for storage? Yeah, yeah, that, that's, that's, uh, that's what it's about. So uh, what's the level of purity uh, that needs to be, uh, uh, when it, depending on the different transport modes, uh, but also I think this is about uh, heat and about the temperature, uh, and some other uh, standards, let's say, uh, for those those flues to be actually to be transported and then stored. And there's a bit of an economical fight behind it because who, how pure do you want it to be? Uh, are you going to put the onus on the, let's say, the, the, the storage side uh, that you have to make very, very, uh, I don't know, solid pipes or other infrastructure that really will not degrade? Or I'd say like the emitters need to come with 99% purity. Uh, for instance, Northern Lights and they have very high standards. So, so this, this, this uh, it's not a battle, but it's a bit of a, a struggle uh, to find the right standards so that you can really use this, the same standard for the transport and storage across, across Europe, which is really important because right now we don't have that. Okay. 99% purity is expensive. Exactly. So, uh, yeah, uh, have we got a microphone up at the top there? And I think this will probably be the last question, so we can continue with the tea break. Hi, thanks, time. everyone. Uh, Wael from the Department for Energy Security and Net Zero. Uh, I've just got a question on a uh, point just made on uh, providing geological data as part of the Net Zero Industry Act. Um, obviously, it's really important that all parties have access to relevant information, but is there a, is there a point area you could point us towards that says what type of data, when, and where? And for example, is there an interaction between I different companies? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I can have to check with my colleagues, but I don't know. Yeah. Okay. But we know that getting the fundamental data, geological data, out of the geological surveys has been impossible, of course, because that's the bread and butter. 